cure for cancer is in the mind of a junior high girl, the odds are that we'll never find it. Because research shows that by the time that girl is in second grade, both boys and girls are well acquainted with the notion that math is for boys. So by the time she reaches junior high school, she will have been laboring under those confidence-zapping stereotypes that say girls can't do things like math and science for at least half a dozen years. Couple that with the fact that the absolute last thing a girl in junior high wants to do is to stand out or be different, and it's no wonder that we lose many bright, capable young women in junior high school because they turn away from math and science at the very time in their lives when so many opportunities in those areas begin to open up for them. Now, it is true that by the time she reaches high school, that today in the United States, 50% of advanced placement calculus students are women. But it's also true three months later, when those high school seniors reach the college campus as freshmen, that only 17% of engineering majors are women. And surprisingly, that number hasn't changed in over 20 years. So the odds of that junior high girl getting the education she needs to see her dream of curing cancer become a reality, well, those odds are slim. So why is that? What's going on? What's the problem? Well, largely, it's us. It's our society, our culture, if you will. Because we're the ones, whether on purpose or unintentionally, who perpetuate, we perpetuate those um, antiquated, inaccurate, and to be perfectly honest, damaging stereotypes that say things like, girls can't do engineering and science. But it's more than that. You see, those stereotypes fuel a lot of what's called implicit or unconscious or unintentional bias against women in engineering and science. And that implicit bias, it turns out, is more damaging than the stereotypes themselves. You see, implicit bias affects our attitudes, our reactions, our expectations of women in engineering and science. It also fuels a continual stream of what are called micro inequities or micro insults aimed at women. Things which by themselves may not look like such a big deal, but collectively, together, over a career, over a lifetime, they can add up to a lot. And they can make it really difficult for a girl or a woman in engineering or science to stick with it, to contribute, to live up to her potential, to dream. Let's look at an example of implicit bias. Research uh, tells us that we all find it really challenging to view a woman in a traditionally male field like engineering or science as competent. We tend to devalue her contributions and dismiss her accomplishments. Let's say that you've been appointed to a new committee at work and the charge for your committee is to hire an engineer. If I make up a resume for an engineer, just totally make it up, put anything on it that I want to, and I take that resume and I put a man's name at the top, like David, then I take that same resume and I put a woman's name at the top, say Maria, and I take those identical resumes for David and Maria and I submit those to the hiring committee. Then research shows that the committee will evaluate David as more qualified than Maria every time, even though their resumes are identical. In fact, research suggests that Maria would have to be as much as two and a half times more competent than David to be rated equal with him. Two and a half times, wow. It's no wonder we don't have a lot of women and girls in engineering and science. But it doesn't stop there. It turns out that K-12 teachers are susceptible to implicit bias. 
Research shows that teachers call on boys more in math class than they do girls. That's true even when the teachers think that they're calling on boys and girls the same. It turns out that those stereotypes that say things like girls can't do math and science affect more than just the second graders. It's also true in things like symphony orchestra tryouts. When symphony orchestras go to a double-blind review system, one where the judges and the musicians who are trying out can't see each other, then the number of women that secure traditionally male spots, like first chair trumpet, skyrocket. You see, if the judges can see the gender of the musicians who are trying out, then their implicit biases, things like women don't play with as much power as men, actually affect their ability to accurately judge what they're hearing. It's the fact that implicit bias is unintentional or unconscious, that we're not even aware that we're doing it, that makes it so damaging. We think that we're being fair and unbiased, when in reality, we're acting in ways that many times are exactly opposite our intended values. Now, I know what you're thinking, but this isn't a guy thing. Research shows that women, that me, that we are just as guilty of implicit bias in all of these situations as men are. It's not a guy thing. Like I said earlier, it's a culture thing. But it's our culture, and we can change it if we want to. We can educate ourselves about implicit bias and its damaging effects. We can look out for its influence on our behavior and our attitudes. We can insist on using objective criteria when we evaluate people instead of subjective opinions. We can do all of those things. We just have to decide that it's important enough to do so. Now, while it's true that our society perpetuates a lot of stereotypes about who can do engineering and science, it's also true that we perpetuate a lot of stereotypes about the disciplines of engineering and science themselves. And those stereotypes turn girls away. I mean, we portray engineers as lonely nerds in white lab coats working on boring theoretical projects and laboratories. When in reality, research shows that girls, and increasingly today, all millennial students, both boys and girls, are far more interested in helping and doing good than they are in building a bigger, better, faster rocket ship. Fortunately, the opportunities to help and do good in engineering and science have never been greater. In 2004, the National Academy of Engineering came out with a list of what they called 14 grand challenges for engineering in the 21st century. Large, complex, interdisciplinary problems facing our world today. Things like coming up with sustainable solutions for our burgeoning energy needs, or developing new treatments and medicines for diseases, or addressing infrastructure issues, things like crumbling roads and bridges and access to clean water, all of which provide unlimited opportunities for engineers and scientists to help and do good. We just need to get that message out to our kids, to our second grade girls. Because if we wait until junior high or high school to start sending the message that a career in engineering and science can give you opportunities to make the world a better place, well, it's too late. So, all of this may be well and good, you're thinking, but, you know, in the end, why does it really matter? Research shows that starting in kindergarten, that girls study more than boys do, that they value school more than boys do, that they make better grades than boys do. So it should be no surprise that women now outnumber men in college three to two, and they're also more likely to graduate from college than men are. Now, I'm the mom of a 21-year-old son who's sitting back there who's majoring in engineering in college. 
So on the one hand, I know that this data is telling us that we have got to do a better job of engaging boys in school. On the other hand, I know that the data is telling us that if we aren't attracting girls and women to engineering and science, then we aren't going to be producing many engineers or scientists. At the very time in our nation's history, when we're under increasing pressure to maintain an innovative edge in the world economy and to solve increasingly complex and challenging scientific and technical problems, all of which requires a substantial pool of engineering and science talent. Something I might add that many other countries don't seem to have much problem producing. Moreover, if we want to solve those really challenging scientific and complex problems, it turns out that we need a diverse team. People of different genders, people from different races, people from different socioeconomic classes, different parts of the country. Because research shows if you want to come up with an innovative solution to a really challenging problem, then a diverse team will trump a team of experts every time. So, if we want that cure for cancer to be there when we need it, then we all have to work at getting the message out to our girls that not only can they do engineering and science, but that we need them to do engineering and science. We need to, them to dream about using engineering and science to make the world a better place. Because the dreams of that junior high girl aren't just the key to building her future. They're the key to building our future. Thanks.